Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. It's truck week on Motor One, and not because we planned it that way. For whatever reason, there's just a lot of truck stuff happening this week. The biggest thing is the Texas State Fair, which has become the place for truck makers to debut new additions and updates for their most popular trucks. On this week's episode, we'll talk about all the news coming out of the Texas State Fair and then ask the big question, why are we Americans so obsessed with trucks? Joining me is MotorOne.com writer Chris Bruce. How are you doing, Chris? Doing great. Good to be here. And in the other chair is writer Christopher Smith. Doing wonderful, John. Let's get to it. Yeah, I'm going to have to use your last name since we're we're doubled up on Chris's today. It's, it's All the right. Chris show. <laughs> it is the Chris and John show. All right. So first things first is the Texas State Fair. Now, I've been in this business a long time, and I can tell you 15 years ago, the Texas State Fair wasn't something I ever heard about or came on my radar. And then all of a sudden, the automakers began using this event in particular to debut new editions of their trucks and sometimes new vehicles or or, or redesigns um, altogether. So it, it went from being kind of uh, nothing that we would pay attention to, to being almost like an auto show unto itself. Uh, and it's because the Texas market is so important for truck sales. Um, so many trucks are sold there and obviously just you know, it's part of the identity of the state, I think. It's happening this week, and we know everything that is debuting there. So I want to kind of take a, a trip through all the news that we know um, is going to be announced there. Um, by the time this airs, uh, the state fair will have already happened, but uh, we're actually a, a day before or so. So, Smith, why don't we start with you? And I know Chevy has a couple announcements for the Silverado. Yeah, they've. Uh, I mean, they've got a couple new appearance packages. Not entirely appearance packages. Um, they've got a new off-road focused midnight edition um, that's going to be on the fifteen hundred. It's the LT Trail Boss, the custom Trail Boss trims. It gets a two-inch factory suspension lift, and it also has the uh, all-black pretty much everything. I mean, it's 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 the midnight edition, right? So it's going to get the black badging, black grill, black bow ties, black bumpers. It's a black truck. Um, Which looks, uh, it, uh, you know, it looks awesome. They they issued a, a picture and we're going to get some live pics of it up on the site too. And of course, whenever I, I think murdered out cars <laughs> look great, I think they look really cool. But I, my last car or the last car that my wife drove was all black. And just as an owner, I did not like owning a black car because every scratch showed up on it uh, so much and dirt as well. It oh, was yeah. just, yeah. Well, it, I, I mean, that's that's the bane of every car guy's existence is the black vehicles always look the best and they're always the hardest to take care of just because it shows every little detail. And, and I mean, I've looked at it. I'm not a fan of the new Silverado, the new design. I know a lot of people aren't a fan of the new design. I actually, it, I'll it looks be, good in I'll black. I'll counter. I like it. Then you should love it in black because I kind of, <laughs> I kind of like it in black. I mean, you know, is everything better in black? The Silverado, the new one, the the Midnight Edition could make a case for it. You never know. I, I think black helps hide lines that might look awkward that people don't like. So maybe maybe that's what helps it. it I like the little subtle touch of the red uh, tow hooks at the front. It's nice. Nice little contrast. Nice little pop, little it, pop yeah. of color. It it is, it is. I got to I got to give him a little bit of credit there. It's you know usually appearance packages can be kind of meh, but hey, this one works. Uh, but there's another one down there as well, uh, and it's called the Rally Edition. It's not in black. You can get it in several colors, and basically well, parts of it's, it are black. It's well, well, yeah, parts of it are black, uh, as opposed to the Midnight Edition, which is black everywhere. Um, the, the parts that are black, what I think the badging is black. Uh, you can get the black bow tie badges, black exhaust tips. Um, hood, but more, hood more importantly, stripes. there there are the black hood stripes, and it also has the body colored grill. It's just kind of a sportier look for the truck. And I think actually the body color grill makes this one. Uh, it gives a uh, new look to the front, and I think it makes the grill look less large because uh, it splits it in two with the body color. So I I, I think both of these I, I both of these are good aesthetic packages uh, and they probably won't cost much i don't think we have prices for them but they're usually like a thousand dollars or less for one of these appearance packages and right and i i you know the more the better because it just appeals to more taste yeah there i'm looking at the press release right now um there's no pricing mentioned on either um and you know they look good chevrolet i, I haven't looked at the sales numbers recently but i know their their truck sales have been down 
They have this, been. This this could and, be a way for them to uh to pick that up a little bit. Yeah, to juice it a little. Um, we have reported that they are working on kind of an emergency update for the interior. Uh. I don't know that the interior is the entire reason that it's not selling as well yeah, as it could be. I don't think that's the issue, but I think it's one of the issues. Um, but I, you know, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I don't want to call myself like a, f- a fan of the exterior because I don't think it's the the best looking truck, but I don't think it's a bad looking truck either. So the next piece of news from the Texas State Fair is a little bigger than a appearance package. It's Nissan debuting in the 2020 Titan. And this is a mid-cycle refresh, so we've got a little bit more than just you know colors and stripes and things like that. So it gets uh, the Titan is getting a new front end um, that looks uh, pretty sharp, and I would say like a little futuristic. Um, it almost doesn't match the rest of the truck, which is a little weird. Uh, but I would say it looks better than the the current model. Um, also, they have retuned the 5.6 liter V8 in the Titan to produce 400 horsepower. Uh, And that's an important number because it lets Nissan say that they offer the most powerful standard V8 engine in the class. Uh, And what's funny is that uh, it's not that much more powerful than the others. So I looked it up. Uh, Ford's V8 offers 395 horsepower. Uh, Chevy and GM's offers 355 horsepower. So that one's a little lower. Uh, but the Rams is 395 again, and Toyota's is 381. So it it pushes it just above uh, the Ford to kind of grab this crown. What I think is interesting is that Nissan has figured out, oh, this is all just a marketing game <laughs> to get the highest number. Like, no, I don't have to, I, that can't I don't be have right. To, I don't have to actually be a better truck. I just have to be able to say on paper, I have the most this or that. And this is what I, I, you know, it's it's kind of meaningless that they tuned it to to you know hit 400 horsepower because I really think they tuned it just so they could say that, not so it would have like an appreciable amount of horsepower uh, more. But uh, they're just learning to h- how to play the game, which they you know they need to be if they want to play it with uh, Ford and GM and and Ram because uh, they're masters at it. Oh yeah, and and I mean, hey, the numbers, however frivolous they can be. It, it it matters in the in the world of yes. bragging rights. It absolutely yeah. matters when you can get on TV and say, "Hey, we have the most powerful uh, gas V eight that you can get in a half ton truck." Doesn't, yep. doesn't matter. It doesn't something. matter that no. it's that it's a couple digits. You know, it's, it'll it's, it'll move it'll move some trucks for sure. Um, and that uh, the retuned engine gets matched with a new nine speed automatic, so that'll help. Um, might help boost fuel economy as well. Um, also they're adding, um, Nissan's safety shield 360, uh, suite of technology. That's stuff like, um, uh, blind spot alert and, and parking sensors and things like that, uh, which is good. The Titan should have it, but it's not revolutionary, you know, Ford and Ram and all them have had it for a long time that this is more catch up. Um, and it will get a slightly redesigned interior, uh, with the biggest change there being a nine inch touchscreen display uh we have definitely entered a period of screen wars in the truck yeah in the truck segment with ram having its giant uh portrait shaped screen and ford following suit um and so this is i think what the best nissan can do with a mid-cycle refresh is put a nine inch screen in uh so so a fairly substantial mid-cycle refresh uh for the titan um, you'll be able to see it on uh, MotorOne.com. Uh, you can uh, have your own judgment of what the new exterior looks like. Uh, Nissan is calling it uh, powerful warrior design <laughs> language. So I would think that, I mean, if you're a warrior, doesn't that kind of go without saying that hopefully you're powerful as well? What, you could be a weak warrior. I guess if you, I mean, you want to be a bad to- You totally can't. That makes absolutely no sense at all. It's just, but yeah. you know, I'm looking at the Pro X4 and I kind of dig the, uh, the exterior upgrade. I really do. The interior, uh, it's just, it looks like a very busy place to be, you know, a busy place or just like, you know, a generation or two old yeah. compared to the, um, to the domestic trucks that, which are just so refined and their interiors, uh, at least Ram and Ford, uh, are just world class, uh, not only in the truck segment, but geez, I mean, compared to luxury cars, yeah. when you when you option up these trucks to be seventy thousand dollars, it is exactly what they feel like. Oh yeah, so, yeah, I agree with you, Smith. The Pro Four X is definitely, to my eye, the most attractive of the bunch. I don't really like the 
kind of the big, it's not quite chrome. It's kind of a matte finish on some of the other ones, but the black grill on the Pro 4X kind of makes it look the best. It it, it definitely has sort of the warrior tough look. I mean, the, the chrome, the, the chrome almost looks out of place on this truck yeah, for some it's, reason. It's almost too big or something. I don't know. I can't quite describe it because I'm just starting to see images of it now. We haven't seen it or I haven't seen it in the real world yet, but at least in photos, it's a little bit too much. You know, I, th- I think it's because when you look at the grill, I mean, it it has a lot going on. It almost has a yeah. solid look to it. It's like there, there isn't there aren't enough openings up there. So it just almost has this kind of big, solid piece of chrome look to it. And it's, it's it just doesn't work for the Titan. It doesn't work for me. Which, you know, is, is more accurate because most grills now uh, are only 20 percent functional and 80 percent, you know, mm-hmm. blocked off. So you're right that this one is is a lot of material and not a lot of opening, but it's still probably the case that it's not even using all that opening to actually let air in. Right. Uh, all right. So the next news comes from uh, Ram. And again, they have a, a couple new editions of their trucks. Uh, Smith, what what's going on there? We're back in black, John. It's a... <sighs> I, I love yeah, it. I have a black. I yeah, love black it. Edition. I love it when I can get an ACD reference in here. ACDC. <laughs> um, no, I mean Ram. That they've got a new fifteen hundred black edition. Which, if it sounds kind of familiar, it's because Ram also debuted their Rebel black edition just a little while ago. It's it's the same thing on the fifteen hundred. Everything is black. You've got the Ram lettering that's black. Badging, tow hook, exhaust, bumpers, grill surround. Door handles, mirrors. It also gets 22-inch wheels. Guess what color they are? Ooh. Black. They black. They are black. black. Yeah. It has a tunnel cover. It God, also gets the sport performance without, hood. How could you keep those from getting scratched? Like, that would just... Ugh. Yeah, it's... Hey, it's... It is what it is. And yeah. um, it's also available in two- or four-wheel drive. You can get it with the 3-liter the diesel, the Hemi, or the V6. But it starts at 53960 bucks. Oof. So Oof. it's going to take a lot of green to get your black Ram. Yes, um, indeed. They also have the Ram HD Night Edition, not to be confused with the black edition. Wait, is it also a blacked out version of the HD? No. Okay, what is it? Ah, uh, the gray? pin drops. No, it's um the the Night Edition, and and Ram also did this earlier with the fifteen hundred Night Edition. It it basically it adds a monochromatic treatment with a little bit of black trim. So it's, I, I guess, night isn't completely black. It's like darkest before dawn. I don't know. So if you want like a dusk edition instead of a, a black edition. <laughs> Maybe like... this should have been called the dusk edition. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it it's a black grill with body colored surround, black badging, um, 20 inch wheels. You, it has like the darker headlight surrounds. It's not completely black, but it's just a darker shade. Um, Dooley's will get black wheels now, uh, which is apparently a new thing. And oh, that'll look interesting. Ironically enough, the the bigger HD starts much lower. It starts at thirty seven nine ninety five for the uh, for the HD Night Edition. Wow, that is interesting. That it's so less, so much less expensive than the uh, fifteen hundred Black Edition. Right now, I mean, keep in mind, I mean, thirty seven nine ninety five starting price. That's going to be for a twenty five hundred two wheel drive. Um, yeah, so I can, think the only difference is they're offering that on more, on on lesser or more base models, right. whereas the black edition of the fifteen hundred they're offering on more expensive trims. But you know, I mean, Ram loves their uh, their special editions, and they all buy, do. Buyers buyers love their special editions too. So they do. And here, so here's the thing that I I think Toyota maybe either refuses to acknowledge or hasn't figured out yet, and that maybe. Uh, Nissan is figuring out, or, or or perhaps they both don't. But the point is you not only have to have a million different configurations for your truck with short box, medium box, long box, you know, regular cab, super cab, crew cab, you need all, you need all those combinations. And on top of that, you need to have eight special editions. You need to have a constant rotating portfolio of special editions. And it's just, yeah, I know. And, and I think Toyota and Nissan either don't want to play that game because it is so expensive to just like keep adding more and more, uh, or they haven't figured out that like you need that to compete. Um, I, I just I look at the sales numbers for the Titan and the Toyota Tundra compared to the domestic trucks, and they're so much lower. It makes me wonder, like, why do you even try? Like, like how long are how long you're going to keep selling the Titan and the Tundra? 
uh, at those at that volume. And I don't know, maybe they have a good business with some fleet sales or they figure we can pick up the people who are really price sensitive. Um, but honestly, these days, only the Tundra has a real price advantage because uh, the Titan has pricing that's much more similar to the domestics. Um, so you don't even really have that, oh, well, at least it's cheaper argument. Well, you know, it's yeah. I mean, it's it's sort of like and I'm not saying I go to casinos a lot. But if you ever go to a casino and you're like sitting down at the big, you know, mega millions machine and you're dropping quarters in thinking, man, if I just hit the right combination, I can score this huge payout that I think I kind of see uh, see Toyota and Nissan kind of standing on the side like that thinking, oh, if we just hit the right combination with our I don't trucks. know, man, there is no like the right combination is all the combination. There's <laughs> not like there's not one. <laughs> and, and, and is it really expensive, though, to just create like a black edition? I mean, to just paint your trim well, black? I mean, it, to me, it, it almost seems like a no brainer. Hey, probably, if, if we can uh, if we can just paint things, you know, yeah. spend a thousand bucks and put this extra trim on and then charge an extra five grand and pull in people. You know? It's not expensive to offer special editions, probably, but it is expensive to offer five engines and three bed lengths and three cabs. And so that's why I think you don't see um, Toyota and Nissan doing as much of, of that. Um, all right, well, let's keep moving. The, the next one is from Toyota, uh, and Toyota uh, actually is not debuting a truck uh, or a special edition at the Texas State Fair. They are debuting a special edition of the Forerunner. Uh, body on frame SUV. So not a truck, but at least it's body on frame and a true traditional SUV. Um, it's called the Venture Edition. And to be honest, this is like kind of the weakest special edition I've ever seen because really the only thing you're getting is this uh, Yakima Mega Warrior roof rack uh, on top of it, which is a huge roof, roof rack. It's 52 inches long, 48 inches wide. Uh, and allows you to put uh, tons of stuff on the roof uh, of the Forerunner. Um, the other stuff it gets um, is really minor. Uh, TRD wheels, blacked out badges and accents, again, with the blacking, blacking out. Uh, TRD logos, um, uh, all-weather floor mats. Uh, I guess and there's one more thing, uh, more storage solutions in the trunk. So it seems like the theme of this one is... Uh, a special edition that can carry more cargo than your regular Forerunner. So you can carry it on the roof and you have a couple more ways to carry it in the cargo area. But that's about it. And otherwise, it just pulls some parts bin stuff from uh, other Forerunners like the TRD uh, and stuff. So no pricing availability. Um, and all they've said is it'll be uh, available to purchase shortly. So uh, not huge news and no Tundra news uh, or uh, Tacoma news, uh, but a little something for the Forerunner. And then similarly, Ford had something as well that was not truck related. Why don't you tell us about that, uh, Bruce? Sure thing. So Ford at the Texas State Fair, they unveiled the new King Ranch edition of the Expedition. And they also announced some upgrades to the Platinum trim uh, for the 2020 model year. So getting to what's really new first, the King Ranch, it's essentially, it's an Expedition. You get a lot of the features from the Platinum, but uh, you get trim in the color Ford calls elegant stone gray, which to my eyes looking at it is almost closer to a shade of brown to me, but hey, maybe my eyes are going. Um, and then on the inside, you get a really nice leather in a two-tone combination of super dark brown and black with uh, some wood trim. Um, and that's basically it. You do get a lot of the features from the Platinum, like um, uh, the continuously controlled suspension damping system, the 360 degree camera system, heated side mirrors, things like that. But it, in all, it's essentially the special trim on the outside and uh, the, the two-tone brown and black leather on the inside. Man, I got to tell you, the these two editions are just money printing machines because they're just I mean, uh, the Platinum is is the highest, uh, most expensive trim that you can get of the Ford trucks expedition included in that the Platinum trim there. Right. And, and the then, 20. So just to hit that real quick, the 2020 Platinum, the upgrades for that is that there are now uh, some new 22 inch wheels and the even bigger changes are in the inside because leather now covers the instrument panel, more of the door dr door trim than before the console center console rails and the armrests. 
So more leather. Yeah. So basically, I mean, with the King Ranch, they're slotting uh, trim right below the platinum for another option for wealthy individuals who can afford to spend 60, 70 plus thousand dollars on an expedition. Not yeah, uh, we actually previously reported on that. Cars Direct, which is a generally a very good source of pricing info, they're saying that the King Ranch with destination is going to start at 74290 uh, We don't have that officially from Ford yet, but Cars Direct's usually pretty good on pricing. And so keep in it's mind, be right these, in there. these vehicles, particularly trucks and the large SUVs, are like they're, they're of their price, more of their price is profit than any other vehicle. Oh, yeah. So every expedition Ford sells is worth so much more than, say, a Mustang, because so much more of that price is just pure profit. Uh, and when they just keep jacking up the price a little bit with these trim levels, um, you know, they, they make more money. Now, that said, I'm not faulting them. I actually like the King Ranch Edition. I think it looks uh, fabulous. Um I and the really like the kind of two tone leather, the brown and black. They look real good together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I give Ford credit there. The the interiors on their trucks and their SUVs uh, have really been favorites of mine for a long time. I and mean, you get those warm tones. It's it's a very nice place to be. Yeah. Although, actually, I think my favorite truck interior is the Ram one, and I forget the name, but it's like the cowboy. Um, oh, I know what you're talking about. The cowboy trim. Yeah. I mean, it's got like belt buckles and embossed like, you know, <laughs> I know. it's like designed it's like straight by up the cowboy. Leather. It is straight up cowboy. And I, I totally dig that. Yeah. And like the the wood trim is like unglossy and it almost looks like, you know, just uh, re reclaimed wood from a barn or something. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, OK, so that's the Texas State Fair. That's what we know is debuting there. Um, and. We will cover that all on Motor One. It'll it'll all be up on Motor One by the time you're listening to this. So check it out there. Uh, but it leads into a bigger discussion, really a discussion that I think I have every year or, or almost every month when I'm looking at the sales numbers, because that's a hobby of mine is to look and see how everything sells each month. And trucks overwhelmingly are the most popular vehicles in the US. If you didn't know that, uh, you should. It shouldn't be a surprise because you probably see more of them on the road than any other vehicle. But it's not even close. Like if you take the best selling passenger vehicle, which might be the Camry or maybe something like the Rogue, a Nissan Rogue crossover, those are selling, you know, 400 to 450,000 units per year, which is a lot. You know, the F-150 alone sells between 900,000 and a million units per year. So the, the most popular truck almost doubles the most popular passenger car. To answer why, I was thinking about it earlier, and I have a couple answers. So let me let me go through them a little bit. First answer is because, and I was when I was trying to answer this question, I was thinking, why do we like trucks and the Europeans don't? And it's not that they don't like trucks; they just don't buy them, and we don't. And the, and so the automakers don't sell them over there. For one thing, we work big. So when I say that, I mean a lot of the trucks being purchased in the U.S. are being purchased for work. Um, either they're being purchased on kind of a fleet level and companies are using them for work, or you're just a, a guy or a gal who has a tough job and you need to haul a lot of stuff and you need a big truck for that. So there's a, I think there's a genuine need and purpose. Really for, though? I mean, is, is, yeah. there, is there, is there really, I mean, how I, I see so many trucks that are just kind of cruising the roads one person in them, never anything in the back. I mean, I'm not saying that they don't and I'm exist get to for that. purpose. I, I think you, I, I think most of us don't see the trucks that are doing work because they blend into the background. Like you just don't notice them. But when the guy driving by in a lifted truck with truck nuts hanging off the back, you notice that. And then you're like, God, that guy's an idiot. <laughs> but if you see the plumber drive by, if you see, you know, the landscapist drive by, anything like that, those are the ones that kind of just, uh, fall into the background, but I think, uh, and, and I, I, this is an opinion. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but trucks became such a staple in America first because of the actual need. I think what happened next was they became part of this country's identity, like apple pie and baseball and owning a truck just became like the most American thing you could do. Um, so they became also a status symbol and a lifestyle symbol. You're absolutely and right. Yeah, I would and, buy that argument. 
and that's where we, that's where I think you, what you're talking about. But I also think, aside from buying it because you want to look a certain way or project a certain image, w- Americans also play hard and we play big. Like our toys are big. We have boats. We have RVs. We have things that need to be either towed or hauled. And a lot of times, people are buying trucks as a tool for their playtime. And in those cases. Sometimes, sure, sometimes it's the guy who's got the lifted truck that's loud. Other times, it's just a person who has a truck that they're going to daily drive because on the weekends, they're going to use it to tow their boat or their RV or something like that. So I think it's both a we work big, we play big, and it's gotten wrapped up in this country's identity. And that that's really the gasoline on the fire, I think, is when... It went from beyond us needing trucks to us wanting trucks. I mean, I totally agree with you, John. Um, And let me add a little bit something extra to this in that the United States, it's a wide open space. We're a land, we're a country with big roads, long, straight roads, wide open spaces, open prairies, big mountains, and having a truck to get across that, to carry things across that, whether you're ranching, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's all part of the identity and that's kind of where it started. And you're right in that it, it's now part of, you know, Americana, if you will. What big trucks have big fuel tanks. Yes. And you're right. You can, you can go five, six, 700 miles. Uh, I remember, I mean, you can get, uh, you know, a second gas tank as an option on some, some trucks. That's oh yeah. How, that, that was a big deal back in the day. I remember my dad getting a truck. It had like two gas doors and it's like, what's that all about? Oh my God. You know, I know it's kind of amazing. Well, and, and it goes into the next thing that I think became a factor in the the longevity of the truck's popularity, which is that fuel prices in the U.S. I think over time have been historically cheap. You know, since the the eighties. You know, you a- after the last kind of gas crisis uh, in the late seventies, early eighties, things settled down. Gas got really cheap. Um, everything stabilized, uh, and there's been hiccups here and there, but especially right now, you know, fuel is, is relatively cheap. So even in this time of we're talking about climate change and the need to, you know, more fuel efficiency and all that, it's really hard because the, the price of fuel and the cost of a barrel of oil is, is so low and that helps uh, sell trucks. That's, that's just the case. When, when, when was it that um, oil spiked in the 2000s that was that was exactly. towards the late 2000s like 2000 yeah, so 2008 2010 for something okay. yeah and we saw the and it, it, honestly that you can time that with the uh recession and gm and uh chrysler going into bankruptcy Absolutely. because when the cost of fuel went up suv and truck sales went down and their profits went down and beyond uh, beyond that though um people that had already purchased their big thirsty trucks their big thirsty suvs with big car payments all of a sudden they could no longer afford to drive their trucks so they started running up more credit card debt and then when they yep. couldn't afford the credit cards then they started defaulting on their homes it, it's i mean you can it, it's fascinating to watch that trend kind of progress through the 2000s and it makes me it, nervous because i see the exact same trend happening right now and and i need to be careful because i don't hate trucks i'm not a truck fan um but i see truck culture everywhere and it just makes me wonder uh, people people have the right to certainly buy whatever they want but I, I just can't help but think, man, I mean, are people really extending so, themselves too far, especially when you're talking about seventy and $80,000 pickup trucks and SUVs that uh, that may not really be used yeah. for what they are intended and for? You, the, only, the only thing I would add to that, though, is that's not really the fault of trucks, because I think people do that for Mustangs and Camaros. Well, they yeah, can't it's afford the fault either. Of people. Right, right. So I don't think it's, it's trucks, but... Um, one that leads me into my next thing, which is that a lot of people want trucks because they are such good all around vehicles. And because so many trucks are sold, automakers put more R&D and more development dollars into trucks than any other segment of vehicle that they sell. So the pace of innovation, the pace of uh, and the and the quality of of the build uh, the build quality the use of materials everything on the trucks is higher and and let me qualify that by saying that's 
mostly true just for the domestic automakers for GM and Ram. I'd say that's less true for Toyota and Nissan, who are doing their best to match the domestics, but just aren't really playing at that level in terms of the amount of money they're investing into their truck products. But when you talk F-150, when you talk Ram, and when you talk Silverado and Sierra, these vehicles are constantly coming out with incredible innovations. They're constantly uh, coming out with great designs. I mean, there's a reason people want these vehicles is because they are so good. And I'm not, I would, I would not categorize myself as a truck person like you, uh, Smith. However, uh, as I'm reviewing vehicles, uh, when, when a truck comes along and I drive like an F-150 or Ram, I say to myself, I don't want one, but I would be happy to drive one because this thing is amazing. Um, the only, yeah, the only kind of demerit against it is the fuel economy, but you know, uh, unless you're an environmentalist, does that really hit you in the a- anywhere where it hurts? As long as fuel prices stay low, not really. Now, see, I've I haven't driven the new Ram yet, and that's on my list, and I really need oh. I really need to get into that. But when when you're talking about just you know good all arounders, I have yet to drive a truck or like a full body on frame SUV that really rides comfortably. When I say comfortably, I'm not talking that you know. It, beats you up yeah. constantly but you get in it you hit bumps you still bounce you still it still feels like a truck and there are just, you need to drive the ram I, I i need to drive the ram and you know what honda ridgeline drives awesome but you know but, does, but, the, but the but it's not body on frame right well it's not body on frame but it's still it still has the bed it still has kind of that size you know why isn't the ridgeline thought of in a uh, you know in a in a better light among truck people well, you know it's it's it, it doesn't it, it kind of goes play with that the culture yeah it, it's a culture thing it doesn't try it, it, it's it's not trying to be a piece of americana it's the opposite it's the japanese version of a truck and unabashedly so whereas the tundra and the titan are trying to be americana just with a japanese badge and and i i guess part of me just wishes hey you know what there's nothing wrong with that, but let's focus a little bit more on just building something that can actually be a better all-arounder instead of just something that has a bunch of black badges and uh, and big boisterous grills, you know? Yeah, I I, I agree with that. And, and uh, we'll talk about the future of trucks in a minute, and I think we'll get into that. Um, the last point I would make about why trucks are so popular comes down to basic human psychology, and it's marketing. There, again, more dollars are put into marketing trucks than probably any other type of vehicle. Um, so when you are assaulted with uh, the advertising campaigns for these vehicles, I mean, it, we're, we're all like Pavlovian dogs. <laughs> you know, we, we see Dennis Leary looking or sounding cool in a commercial and we see an F-150 drive by with a giant thing dropped in its bed. And we're like, yeah, you know, I want to be. Uh, macho and and that you know ticks all the right uh, boxes, um, you know for the you know the kind of image I want to project. And so I mean, even even when we think about the ads we're seeing and we're saying like, oh, I see what they're doing, it's still working. Like <laughs> it's still having the effect they want to oh, have. It, it definitely still works. Um, I, I was at Cars and Coffee just this past weekend. A guy across the street pulled in with a big Chevy Crew cab. Uh, lifted Z71, and it, it must have had 26 inch wheels and 30 series tires. And I was just like, wow. "Dude, you are not going off road anywhere." I have, I have nothing. I have no problem with a big lifted truck, but come on, man, you have 30 series tires. You're not taking that truck off road. Oh, I just, I, I'm going off yeah. on a tangent. I, it had to be said, but uh, I kind of look at that like, yeah, it's not my thing, but it's personal expression through your it, automobile. It is, it, and, it is. and I, sh- I shouldn't be quite as judgmental. But uh, yeah, it's uh, but it, that could be that could show up so many different ways on people's vehicles and lots of ways that I would never do, you know, like, you know, I wouldn't, you know, model my car after something in Fast and the Furious either. Uh, but there's other stuff I would totally do and and other kind of aesthetics and things that I would love to uh, change on my car to personalize it a little but, bit. But the that, big that, suspension that that lift choice. with little tiny tires. I mean, it's, it's like it, it's <laughs> like they're they're exact opposites. It's it's like putting it's like putting a big turbo on a uh, on a nice import and then get, getting one of those stupid little like twenty dollar eBay uh, little fan things that sits in the air intake. It's just like yeah. 
you're defeating your own purpose. I know. I so know. I have one more theory that I've discussed with people for a while, and I want to get your theory on it. And it specifically is in regards to the really high dollar trucks, the, mm-hmm. you know, the Ford Platinums and, you know, the seventy, eighty thousand dollar models is that in it, this is just my opinion and a slightly educated opinion, I think, is that in large swaths of the country, there still is a certain there are still people that look down on a lot of luxury brands, imported luxury brands, whether it's BMW, Audi, Mercedes, something like that. So when you pull up in a seventy thousand dollar F one fifty, no one really yeah. looks askew as opposed to if you had spent seventy thousand dollars on a Mercedes E class. Yeah. The money's the same, but th- there is it. They do not. The trucks do not have the same. I don't know, snob factor, I guess me, is the best way I can think of it. Let me actually add some texture to that theory uh, because I agree with it 100%. I think if you are the type of person who uh, buys American, let's say, and that's important to you, and you're you're wealthy, uh, and you're looking around at the luxury options for you, and you're looking at Cadillac and Lincoln, you might say, uh, that's not a great choice compared to the European luxury automakers or the Japanese ones. But if you look at a seventy or eighty thousand dollar truck, I think you might say, actually, that's a better luxury car than what I could get at Cadillac or Lincoln. Oh yeah, I think, I think that there's a very good argument there. Yeah, I so I think I think some people look at the, you know, they're so evolved, they're so refined now. Um, that they they make better luxury vehicles than what uh, the American automakers are making, and for people who uh, buy an American is important, uh, it might be a better choice. You know, I, I and I'm forced to agree with you there, Bruce. That makes absolute sense. And there's a big part of me that hates that it makes absolute sense. It's like <laughs> it's like buy the vehicle that you want, and if you're looked down upon by somebody across the street, that's their problem. You know, oh. Yeah, I don't think it's so much. I don't know that it's people doing it because they're worried how they'll look in their community. I think those people genuinely. But I think it's. I think people just you know genuinely don't want to buy an import and don't want to buy a car. Like no, I think these are the. It's it. Take the person who you saw who had the huge lift and the thirty inch uh, wheels or thirty series wheels and uh, tires. Take that person and give them a $400,000 a year job, and they're still going to buy a truck, right? They're not going to all of a sudden be like, oh, I want an S-Class. Possibly. Uh, So uh, I I think those people are truck people, and truck people stay truck people. I mean, especially especially because they start buying other things that you need a truck to play with, (laughs) like boats and RVs and things like that. I, I I don't see somebody driving a truck like that suddenly making 400 grand a year and then just doing the same thing i I don't know see i I think i I I kind of do though at least so i i have i i i know some fairly wealthy people that are very into horses and horse culture oh my god yeah i do they will not they do make 400 grand a year and do do choose luxury pickups over anything else because I they guess in that it. case, it's more of a thing of need. Well, yeah. Than... I mean, there, there's an absolute need there. You're towing a big trailer, well, but it's need and it's the culture and image thing because that's the, you know, that, uh, horses and whatever they're doing, if they're showing or jumping them, whatever, um, that's part of the image is, you know, it's not showing up to the, to the, to the grounds in an S class. It's showing up in a truck. And now they have super luxurious trucks to show up in. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not faulting that they exist. I'm I'm just questioning how many people are actually going to use that for the need. And it's not it's buying a vehicle is, yeah. isn't just about need. Uh, I mean, it it kind of it wraps all around to the Americana well, culture. The, I think the uh, the interesting thing is that over time, trucks you know go back to the 80s and 70s. They didn't have a bunch of uh, cab sizes. They just had kind of a medium bed or a long bed. Either way, you had a pretty big bed to do stuff with, to, to be functional. Nowadays, the vast majority of trucks come with a, you know, a super crew, four full-size doors, which only leaves room for a small bed. And so now you can't even carry a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood in the back of most trucks today. They, now, they will 
tow uh, as well as they used to, but they won't haul as well as they used to because half their bed is gone. So I think in that regard, you're right, Chris, a lot fewer people are buying them for need because they, they're capability to haul has been kind of cut in half not in terms of payload just in terms of uh, bed size yeah payload is up but square footage in the bed is down I right could, yeah so you just need to you need to haul denser items to <laughs> take advantage <laughs> and another way so and another way to look at all of this too is i mean really the the modern pickup truck has replaced the big american full-size sedan as the big american vehicle yeah i, I, I yes. mean there's there's no question there you don't have any big body and frame Cadillac sedans or anything from Lincoln or Ford. I mean, you still have some, some, well, you have the Lincoln continental, but I mean, it's not nearly the size that it, that it used to be. No. And, and trucks, that's something that we didn't mention. Trucks have also really inherited that role. Yeah, I agree. Let's talk about the future of trucks a, a little bit. So, you know, will anything knock the truck off its pedestal in the sale in terms of sales i think the only thing that can do that is fuel prices mm -hmm. um and, and that could be the market that could be you know a fuel shortage or um un instability somewhere uh in the world uh, where a lot of oil comes from or it could be through legislation it could be you know um the government deciding we're going to have a two dollar tax on oil uh, now Let's be and, honest. That's not going to happen, right? No, I, I don't. <laughs> not I, anytime honestly, soon. I, don't see, I don't see either of those really happening. However, despite that, there is already work on electric trucks, uh, and and not just a little research here and there, and we might see them. They are coming. Uh, they are coming from Tesla, which is going to debut at least the design of its truck, I believe, in November. Um, it's coming from Rivian, the other electric startup that has an investment from both Ford and Amazon. Uh, they've already showed their truck and it had a, an extremely good reception. Um, and Ford is planning its own electric F-150. And of course, if you're an automaker like Ram or GM and you're not already working on your electric truck, you're behind the times. And we've already heard that they are. Uh, so what these trucks will will offer actually, and and I think electric powertrains actually make a good fit with trucks uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, they can handle bigger battery packs. And if there's one thing we know about electric cars, it's their battery packs are extremely heavy, uh, especially the larger they get, but you need large battery packs in order to have good range. And from what we have been told from Rivian, they're promising you know 300 to 400 miles of range, which is way up there with the Tesla Model S, uh, which is the current leader in electric range. Um, Tesla has promised the same thing with its truck, um, and hopefully we'll see that from Ford and the uh, and the legacy automakers who are making them. So I think we'll see actually, unlike a lot of the electric cars and and SUVs we've seen hit the market with kind of disappointing ranges that are like 200 to 250 miles, I think we're going to see trucks launch right away with 300 plus miles. Also, with any electric powertrain, you have a lot of horsepower and more importantly a lot of torque available at all speeds and that works again really well with trucks really well with towing um really really well um with work uh and, and all of the duties a truck has to do um so i see that as as kind of electric uh powertrains melding really well with trucks and plus i'm sure they'll all have outlets where you can plug in your power tools and run them directly off your truck um so you know, they've got that kind of going for them as well. So I think it'll be a nice marriage and it'll be a nice, uh, as we go forward, look, I don't think, I don't think the price of fuel is going to go up. I don't think like market forces are going to push us over into electric trucks. However, they're, they're coming anyway. And I think they're going to offer enough upside, uh, that people are going to choose to use them rather than feel like they're forced to use them. Yeah. But John, you're forgetting two major factors. They're not loud and they don't roll coal. <laughs> that is true. And, and I, I uh, hate to say that because I agree with you completely. And in fact, I expand that to all vehicles, electric power with its instant torque, with, with its capacity for horsepower, with its simpler powertrain, electric motor. There's just, there's, there's basically one moving part in there. You know, it's, it makes such sense on, on all aspects. And it especially makes sense in pickup trucks where, as we were saying earlier, that little extra horsepower it's it's all about the bragging rights um mm -hmm. but i you know i haven't been around enough uh 
truck people really to gauge response thus far. I suspect it's going to be a kind of a kicking and screaming kind of thing. Like you're not going to take away my diesel. I hope that what happens with the Tesla Model 3 is what happens with the first electric trucks we get, which is that they show that they're better uh, than their gas powered competition in either so many ways or just so convincingly that they sell on their own merits rather than anyone feeling like they have to or they're taking their medicine by getting an electric truck that people want to get the electric truck because it just does whatever they want done better now that doesn't work if the first electric trucks come out with 200 mile ranges or they don't have incredible uh towing numbers or something like that like you really have to take a page out of the tesla playbook and blow them out of the water from day one. If you don't do that, if you just kind of show up on the scene, I mean, everyone remembers the first generation of these uh, electric vehicles we had four or five years ago with sub 100 mile ranges. I mean, um, Marcioni told us outright, don't buy these. They <laughs> they cost me money to make and I'm only making them because I have to and they're not good. Uh, you know, that that has to end. If anyone wants to sell successfully an electric vehicle you really have to come on the market and best your gas powered counterpart in every way imaginable you know i would um, i would love to see tesla because i mean we were just talking about the 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 model s plaid going after the the porsche over at the nurburgring tesla's going back i would love to see elon go back with a with a truck to ha- have yeah. like a truck prototype and just kind of spring it on the world. Oh, by the way, we ran our truck around and this truck did like an eight minute Nurburgring lap. <laughs> well, and I think Musk, uh, for all his faults, of which there are many, has that Steve Jobs quality of uh, mesmerizing us and really being able to um, surprise I guess I think would be the best word with how like he promises the world and probably under delivers uh, 80% of the time. <laughs> but man, when he over delivers, it's, it's amazing. It, it, um, it gets your attention. It gets your attention. And if anything, it spurs competition, which we've seen now, I think for the, for really the, the first time with the take in, and we're going to see more and more with, uh, and especially, I mean, Rivian doesn't have a, a product selling yet, but it, they they have some prototypes. They look great. I can't wait until Rivian's on the market and you have two um, native electric vehicle producers competing against. Yeah, I mean, I I love the way the Rivian looks. It it has yeah. kind of a macho look to it. I I hope that that truck people will take to it. It's it looks like it could be a very good product. And you're right. If it can deliver on the range, um, and it has these incredible towing capabilities, it's like the only thing missing then, like I said is the noise and for the diesel guys, you know, the diesel smell, the diesel smoke. Now, yeah, you know, say that, say that how you will. I, I don't have bad opinions of truck people. I've owned two trucks. I grew up with diesel. So, I mean, hey, I, I'm a diesel fan. Um, but let's not let that obsession overwrite the fact that an electric truck can be really freaking awesome and everything a truck guy could ever want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it look, if it's... If it's just better than the diesel truck, then, I mean, the person can buy their diesel truck for as long as they keep selling them. But over time, I think that'll be less and less. Um, all right. So before we move on from trucks, I, I I like to end every discussion we have with talking about our favorites. So let's talk about favorite trucks. Uh, let's go around the table. Favorite truck that's on sale right now. Um, Chris Smith, why don't you go first? New Ram. The new Ram. I haven't driven it yet. But it just looks so good on the outside. It looks so good on the inside. I've heard that it drives fantastic. It, this is almost a case of you shouldn't drive your heroes. Maybe that's why I haven't driven it yet. Because I have <laughs> it in my mind that this could be like a truck that I really enjoy driving. You know, it's 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 my choice right now. Yep. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, a perfectly good choice and, and almost uh, the expected one. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to echo you right now. My choice is the Ram uh, as well. It is, I have driven it. It is super comfortable to drive. It looks amazing on the outside. It looks amazing on the inside, um, especially that one trim, which I'm still trying to look up. Oh, I think it's a Longhorn. Yeah, it's a Longhorn. Uh, the Longhorn edition is my favorite. Um, 
it's got the best infotainment system uh, with Uconnect. Um, just so many things going for it. It deserves all the success it's having right now. It's in it's in second place now in sales ahead of the Silverado for the first time in, in forever. So that's my choice as well. Uh, how about you, Bruce? What's your choice? I got to go completely different direction. Sorry, guys. Although it's staying within the same uh, automaker family. Uh, Jeep Gladiator for me. Ah. So I, I got to be honest. I have never owned a pickup truck. I I, my family has always been kind of an SUV family. We've, I've, I learned to drive manual on a Wrangler. We had a Cherokee. Like, I'm familiar with Jeeps and like them. And then, so if I needed to buy a truck, I love that the Gladiator has a roof that I can take off, and I can have a s- almost kind of sort of convertible. There's still a bed in the back where you can throw stuff. If you know, if I ever want to go off roading, it's more than capable of that, especially in the, the higher level trims, the Rubicon and whatnot. Yep. Uh, plus, I live in Bowling Green, Ohio, and Toledo is t- a 20 minute drive, and I visited the Jeep factory there before, so yep. might as well Hometown. support the local local folks. Um, but yeah, but I, I, I like the Gladiator a lot. I ha- I've got to be honest with you. I haven't driven one. Don't drive um, one. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I've driven Wranglers and stuff and I like it. Well, so. if you're familiar uh, yeah. with a Wrangler, I mean, it's 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 kind of rough and tumble. OK, then I, I think I would probably be fine with it then. So, yeah, I would go Gladiator personally. It's interesting that we picked uh, Ram 1500 and Gladiator and they're and they're both from FCA. Yeah. So uh, I would say FCA is is killing it uh, in the truck department right now. Bravo, folks. Um, so. Uh, all right. What about all time? Uh, favorite truck uh, production truck of all time uh bruce i'll start with you this time oh okay so just off the top of my head um it's also so i i need to base it have you guys ever seen the movie tremors it's yes. uh the kaiser jeep pickup from the movie tremors <laughs> yes great choice <laughs> yes. so i guess i'm sticking with jeep again kind of sort of but yeah that okay okay good choice uh how about you smith I got to do two here. Um, an honorable mention has to go to the late seventies Dodge Little Red Express. Okay. With the, okay. The, the the little short bed, the flare side mm-hmm. with the stacks. Yep. That's just an iconic truck. In the late seventies, I think it was the fastest production car that the United States offered because it, it, it wasn't subject to quite the same emission standards as the cars of the day. And it's it's a cool ah. street truck. My my main choice though has to be the second gen Ford Lightning, the SVT Lightning, the uh, the supercharged mm. from ninety nine to 04. That's such a great performing on road truck. I'm not huge into off road. Well, I am, but I'm more of a rally guy as opposed to just like rock crawling. Um, so for my truck, I would just I would rock a Lightning all day long, and I've been so close to pulling the trigger so many times it's not even funny. I know, I know, I've been in the same boat. Great choice. Uh, my choice is also going to be a blue oval uh, truck. I, th- I I bet you thought I was going to say GMC. Oh, Cyclone, I did. But I'm I not. did. I'm going to say uh, Ford Raptor. Uh, all generations, really, because I think the first generation was just a revelation. Uh, the current generation is is uh, light years better than the first one, um, and I think is is might be my my. I said the Ram was my favorite current production truck, but really, I think it's it's probably the Raptor. Uh, I don't I don't go jumping dunes or anything like that. But what I like about it is it's so powerful and fast. But when you're just driving it around, it's also really comfortable because it's it's got these giant tires and this long travel suspension. So it almost rides comfortably, <laughs> which is a little weird. Uh, and when you do get on it, it really does feel like you could just like point it across all the front yards on your street and just, just gun go. it and and just go. And you could turf 20 lawns at a time. You, you know, I, I, uh, I have to I have to give you that one. I went into the Raptor kicking and screaming because I was such a lightning fan. But uh, I've had some experience around them. And they are freaking cool trucks. They really are. Yeah, they are really cool. And their prices are finally coming down on the used ones that, you know, sub $20,000 good ones um, that I think more and more people can get into them. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. Trucks. Hmm. I don't own one, but there's a lot of them I would happily welcome into my garage. And like I said, the electric ones are the ones uh, I'm really looking forward to because I think those are going to be uh, a new revolution, especially because we've got two brand new automakers uh, entering the field. So, 
Um, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, our last episode, uh, which was about BMW's uh, new kidney grill that they debuted on the Concept 4. We had uh, some reader feedback on it. Uh, pretty much all the feedback we have received on uh, BMW's extra large kidney grill has been negative. Likewise, uh, Michael uh, Waddington left a comment on our last episode and said, BMW has overcooked it and lost the plot. The Concept 4 grill is hideous. I don't really know what that means. They've overcooked it and lost the plot. I think he's mixing metaphors there, but uh, I agree with the sentiment. Uh, but Smith, you weren't on that episode uh, with Chris and I, uh, with Bruce and I, about the, the kidney grill. What are your thoughts on the Concept 4 grill? Well, hold on just a minute here. <clears throat> I threw up in my mouth a little bit, uh, kind of oh, thinking about this. <laughs> BMW, if you're listening to this, just stop it. Stop. There's that Michael Jordan yeah. meme. Stop it. Get some help. We're here to help. Yeah. This is not the direction to go that, I mean, beavers are looking at this thing and saying, <laughs> dude, what are you thinking? You know, you know what I think is, is sad too. It's, it's that you're, they're following a trend. They're following, you know, the, the whole big grill thing. Lexus is doing it. Audi's doing it. Uh, like don't be followers, be innovators, like blaze your own path. Uh, next thing you're going to know, we're going to have a giant kidney grill and a floating roof and, you know, pick whatever trendy design, uh, cue that is on cars these days. And it's like your BMW, your luxury brand, you should blaze your own path. I mean, it does, like we said, uh, in the last episode, it makes me nostalgic for, uh, the days of, uh, Bangle and his, uh, provocative although innovative designs you know at least they were original and if you're going to follow i mean there's not necessarily anything wrong with following it's not as innovative but don't follow blindly and i have a feeling that bmw <laughs> yeah. is just like it's like oh 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 bigger grill bigger grill bigger no look at what you're doing look at this car look at the concept for bmw don't look at the grill. I have a feeling that they were only looking at the grill when they were writing this out, you know, designing this up. Yeah. It's no, this is wrong, terrible. That's all I have to say on that. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. All right. Well, coming up, we're going to find out what we've all been driving this week. Uh, but before the break, a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our new or our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, so please hit the subscribe button so you get the latest episode every week. Welcome back. During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with Smith. Uh, Smith, what are you driving this week? Well, uh, it was about a week ago. I had some family come visit me out here in South Dakota. Um, and it's interesting because it ties into our discussion of trucks and SUVs. I just have my Mustang and the Mazda. We had six people, didn't want to take two cars. So I went out and rented a new Suburban. And, uh, and honestly, I, I wanted a minivan because I thought that was going to be a little bit better for us. Um, mm -hmm. the Suburban was nice. It, it, it was, uh, it felt all right inside, but honestly, it still, it reinforced my whole questioning of do people really need a big SUV? If you have a big family, if you're not necessarily towing things, if you're not looking to haul a bunch of stuff, I know minivans aren't cool, but we could have, I think it would have been a more comfortable ride for everybody if, yeah. if I had had a seven passenger minivan instead of this eight passenger suburban, the ingress, especially with, with older people, you're, you're going to have a lot higher step up into something like a suburban than into a minivan. And that's harder. Like I remember, uh, I was in San Francisco visiting family and there was a big group of us there was eight of us and we had a suburban just like you we actually had to bring along a small step stool uh to put in front of the door for my my grandma to get up into the suburban because she just couldn't even with like the uh running boards they were just too high uh and yeah like like that's that's ridiculous as a family vehicle i think a minivan beats uh something like a suburban Every time. I, I think it does yeah. absolutely every time. And uh, and ingress, egress is easier for the rearmost seats. Um, oh, you know, in the, totally. the Suburban, I mean, it wasn't terrible to get to it, but it still wasn't the easiest thing in the world. Was anyone sitting in the way back? If you had six, probably, we, yep, right? We, yep, we had um, uh, my wife sat back there with my mother. And, uh, and I mean, my mother's 80. She was able to get in and Ooh. out. Uh, all right. Um, yeah. But they both even commented that it, it, it just... 
it, it, it was a rough ride back there. It was a rough ride. Oh, yeah. You, you, got a, you get kind of tossed around. And yeah, it's I mean, it's a new Suburban, but it and still it feels kind of like a truck. It's claustrophobic back there. And it's a totally different experience in a minivan where you're, you know, you're, you're in a more normal seating position. You have more room. You have bigger windows. Yep. Um, it all comes back to towing, though. If you got to tow, if you have to tow, the, the suburban, uh, and there are certainly a lot of people that need to tow that still need to have something for the family. But for those that are just thinking about, hey, you know, I've got five or six kids, I need a suburban or a or, or big SUV like that, there are still some minivans out there that can probably do you a lot better. Honestly, um, if it's if it fits your lifestyle, the plug-in hybrid Chrysler Pacifica is just one of my favorite vehicles. Uh, it, it does so well as a family vehicle. And, you know, especially for families whose daily routine is driving, you know, within 10 or 20 miles of home, you save so much gas just plugging it in every night. It's got 30 miles of range, really nice. Can't tow anything with it though. Uh, Bruce, how about you? What are you driving this week? So no driving, but over the weekend, uh, my dad and I went to the NASA. I won't call it NASA because that's just going to confuse people, which is the <laughs> National right. Auto Sport Association. Uh, they held their championships at Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course uh, over the weekend. So my dad and I went to the racing there on Saturday and had a blast. Um, you know, it's NASA is sort of a... I guess a competitor might be the right word to the SCCA, the Sports Car Club of America. Mm -hmm. So the folks there are amateurs. Um, you know, these are guys that just enjoy racing. So, you know, they spend the year racing uh, in various regional championships. And then this was the championships for the year uh, at Mid-Ohio. And but it's much more on the affordable side, like yeah. regular people. You know, if you've got you, you have to invest in a dedicated car. But as long as you can get it to the track, it's not you know, we're not talking about you know, what we normally think of as fielding a race car. Right. And the, that's exactly. So the first race that we saw, so they kind of, in some cases, depending on the size of the field, they group stuff together. So the first race we saw was um, basically their American muscle car classes. Mm -hmm. So it was Mustangs, Camaros, and a guy in a Buick Regal who was really talented, um, uh, all racing together and it kind of going awesome. from Fox body Mustangs up to uh, about mid 2000s Mustangs is kind of the year range you're looking at there. Um, the Regal was one of the the, the 80s models and it, it was just a blast to watch. Um, uh, next race was Spec Miata, which as the, the name implies, everyone's in kind of a spec class that they've built up their car there's kind of you know um they dyno the the winners afterwards to make sure they're not running any crazy engine modifications uh -huh. and but these guys are serious we were standing next to a guy at a corner who had a spotter who was at one of the more complicated areas and was talking th through the driver telling him oh you know this guy's coming up on you oh someone spun <laughs> here there's about to be a full course caution get up on the guy in front of you like these guys are serious despite being you know technically amateurs um the one my dad enjoyed the most was uh the super touring classes mm -hmm. and the best way i can describe it are it seems like they were cars that are no longer competitive for gt3 or grand am type racing but aren't old enough yet for vintage racing so it was c5 c6 corvettes uh, and like the actual full-on race cars uh, there were uh, M3s, Pano's GTS. Um, I'm just looking at kind of the running list now. There was a guy in an RX, at an FD RX7, and those guys were running hard. Um, they, like it was. And those, those were like like um, race cars that had had glorious pasts. That, that were. That's what it looked like to me. Yeah. I, I can't say for certain, but those look. Those were full on race cars, like the spec Miata. They looked like a Miata, you know. But these were. This is the type of thing you would have seen three, four, five years ago racing in a top level class. And now just because of the way the rules changes and stuff, they're no longer competitive there, but they can still race here. And that was super impressive. And then we didn't, it wasn't an actual race. It was just practice, but uh, we caught the practice for spec BMW E30 three series spec Ooh. e46 three series and spec 944 and they were all on the track together and oh that, that's cool yeah and that was super fun because my dad has owned a 944 i had an e30 and 
those guys just look like they're having a ton of fun. Yeah. If you're ever curious why you can't find a good E30 coupe anywhere, it's because they're <laughs> all there. Because they're the field was huge, and yeah. Um, so it's just you know it's amateur level racing, you're, you know, but it's still super fun. Everyone's super passionate. Everyone there is is having a great time. Um, so great weekend. Mid Ohio is a great uh, track to spectate at as well. Oh yeah, um, totally. I really like that one series of turns. That uh, it's kind of like it's not like a corkscrew uh, turn, but it's like you know it's a uh, coming. Uh, decreasing elevation, uh, mm-hmm. right and left hand, and then another hard right. It's just a r- complicated series of turns. That's exactly where the guy was, the spotter guy yep. for the Spec Miata guy was standing. Actually, yeah, it's exciting to watch. Just stuff always happens. People sliding off and contact yeah. and all good stuff. Um, all right. So the past week, I have been driving the 2000, I think it's 19, uh, Nissan Pathfinder Rock Creek Edition. So we were talking about special editions earlier in the podcast, and this is exactly that. It's it's a faux butch, faux off-road version of the Nissan Pathfinder, which, you know, for those who don't know, the Pathfinder is a um, unibody three-row crossover um, it is not a traditional hardcore SUV. It is very much made for on-road and not off-road. The Rock Creek Edition basically is a, a visual, uh, co- I'll call it a costume. It's a visible, it, it's a costume to make it look a little bit more off-road and masculine. Um, but there is there's no uh, mechanical changes whatsoever. Uh, to the suspension, to the engine, to anything else. It's just all visible. Uh, that said, I think it's the best looking Pathfinder you can buy. Um, it came in this really cool green color and the elements are not over the top, so they're, they're kind of tasteful. Uh, and the Pathfinder has been around for a while now, so it's kind of an aged design. Um, and I think at the moment, this is probably uh, throughout the history of this uh uh, generation of the Pathfinder. This is the best looking uh, Pathfinder you can get. Uh, otherwise, it is uh, your garden variety Pathfinder, which, like I said, is getting pretty long in the tooth, uh, especially in the interior, infotainment, all of that. Um, I will give the Pathfinder props, though. We were just talking about uh, ingress and egress into third rows. It has a really good solution for moving the the second row seats forward to get into the third row that really gives you a huge opening um so it's really easy to get back there once you're back there it's about as good as any other uh third row in a crossover but a lot easier to get in and out of the uh, the Um, rock creek is is like a thousand dollar package i think yeah, it's not expensive. So it, again, it's one of those things like we were talking about earlier where, you know, it's it's affordable and it you know, if if it if it aligns with your taste, go for it. And for me, it it did align with my taste. I loved the color and I loved just the little the little fender tweaks and and a, and the wheels and just a couple of the aesthetic things they did. So I'm looking at the Rock Creek that uh they displayed at the Chicago Auto Show. Did the one you have have the bike rack on the back and the uh <laughs> roof pillar or roof rack? Nope, didn't have any of that. Oh, okay. No, sounds like it would have been cooler if it had, though. And I don't even know if Rock Creek is like a brand that they're associating with or if they just made it up and it's the Rock Creek edition. It'd be cooler if it were like a brand and, you know, they had done a partnership deal. Uh, But they do have like Rock Creek uh, sewed into the seats um, and it gets a special Rock Creek badge on the outside uh, of it as well. Like I said, it's it's the, the the best looking Pathfinder you can buy. If you're going to buy a Pathfinder. And you know, there's something which, to be said about bolting up a, uh, a big cargo carrier on the roof. That makes anything look just a little bit cooler. I mean, let's be honest. It does. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, let's put some maybe exterior lights up there, like spotlights. And yeah, there's a lot of things. We, you know, maybe they should just put a snorkel intake uh, <laughs> on the Pathfinder as well. Yes. That's what uh, that's what Toyota does with their TOD yeah. stuff. <laughs> snorkel in a rack. And there you go. You can go anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. So I'll be reviewing that and you'll be able to read that uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but that brings us to the end of our show. You can follow Chris Smith on Twitter at CH Writing, and you can follow Chris Bruce at Chris Bruce 1985, and me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, I want to thank you two for being here with me on the episode. Always a pleasure. Great being here. Great. And thank all of you out there for listening. We'll see you next week.